Even though the free agency period is still young at this point, I thought it'd still be interesting to go through and try and grade how each team has done so far. Whether it be trades or signings, we'll be going over the key moves that GMs have made in order to determine how much the team has or hasn't improved. Keep in mind, we aren't going to be going over every single team because some haven't done much. And with that, here are the winners and losers of free agency 2022 so far. I know, Calgary fans are probably still recovering, but we still have to address the obvious. Despite his efforts, GM Brad Sher Living was still unable to keep a star player in Calgary. Even though it seems like Idro's mind was already made up, the Flames are still the ones who will suffer the loss the most. Reportedly, the contract that was offered to Johnny Hockey was more than what he received with Columbus and was a massive 8-year, $80 million extension. With the Gaudreau issue now put to rest, True Living will now turn his attention to RFAs such as Matthew Kachuk and Andrew Mangiapane. For now, the only thing that could possibly redeem this kind of loss is if Nazem Kadri is somehow drawn to Alberta. Oh wait, maybe not. Just took a look at the Nikita Zadorov contract. So I think this one is pretty easy to figure out. GM Don Waddell let Tony D'Angelo walk in free agency and chosen to bring in Brent Burns from San Jose as a replacement. We previously went over the details of the trade in a video, I'll link below, but essentially Carolina will be paying close to the same amount for Burns as Philadelphia is for D'Angelo. Another great move for the Canes was acquiring Max Pacioretty from Sin City for nothing in return. The team was able to address an obvious need up front and found their finisher that should be a good fit. Even though they did lose Vincent Trocek and will probably lose Nino Niederreiter, Waddell has done a good job finding recruits when needed. Even before free agency kicked off, the Hawks weren't doing themselves any favors. After getting swindled by Pierre Dorian and company in a trade that sent Alex Dabrinkit to Ottawa, GM Kyle Davidson continues to raise eyebrows in Chi-Town. The Doc and Mrazek trades weren't as bad, but it's what Davidson has done during free agency so far that's made things even worse. Supposedly, the mission is to try and get a return from Max Domi, Colin Blackwell, and Andreas Anthonisiu. However, outside of maybe Blackwell, the trio whose contracts expire next deadline won't offer much of a return in the end. The hockey world will be watching in anticipation to see what will happen to Hawks star Patrick Kane. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to realize that, that the Blue Jackets are amongst the biggest winners so far this summer, as they not only managed to reel in a star player on their own, but also signed him to an amount below what other teams were offering. Even though GM Jarmo Kekalainen also produced a questionable contract that will pay Erika Branson $4 million for four years, this still doesn't take away from the W one bit. The big issue now that Kekalainen will be focusing on is clearing some cap space in order to sign Patrick Laine to an extension this offseason. Probably one of the most productive teams on this list, the Red Wings have made a slew of signings happen already this free agency. Andrew Kopp, Dominic Kubelik, David Perron, Oli Mata, and Ben Chirot all were free agent acquisitions. So yes, as I said, GM Steve Eiserman has been hard at work in the Motor City. The overall takeaway from the series of moves is that Eiserman is trying to slowly help his roster become competitive with patience, knowing that Moritz Seider and Lucas Raymond will both be coming off of their ELCs in 2024. The GM strategically has Kubelik and Perron as pending UFAs to help make some extra room. The only real concern is the Ben Chirot contract. For some reason, Chirot has been viewed as better than he really is, at least as far as points and analytics are concerned. If he had a better track record, it might justify paying him $4.75 million for four years, but this one could come back to bite Stevie Y, I'm afraid. For GM Ken Holland, most of the things on his offseason checklist have already been seemingly taken care of. Evander Kane was signed to a four-year, $20.5 million contract. Jack Campbell was also given a sizable deal of his own, valued at $25 million, that will run for five years. Holland was also able to rid himself of the Cassian contract, as we previously mentioned in another video, which freed up some needed camp space. Even though the term on the Campbell contract is a little long considering his age, if he can stay consistent and healthy, it could pay off for the oil. After a postseason of disappointment and bidding Claude Giroux goodbye, the Panthers have been relatively quiet this offseason. Letting Ben Chirot walk was probably the best decision, and recruiting Mark Stahl from Detroit seems like a pretty low-risk move, considering he's only signed to a one-year deal worth a modest $750,000. However, a player that was probably harder for GM Bill Zito to depart with was Mason Marchment. 
Undrafted and determined, Marchment, after a couple of seasons, had a breakout campaign with Florida most recently. Therefore, watching him cash in in Texas and not having any cap space to prevent it from happening has to be a tough pill to swallow for the Panthers fan base altogether. The biggest thing that's happened in the Music City has been the signing of longtime pride Philip Forsberg. Similarly to Evgeny Malkin and others that held out until the last minute, Forsberg decided to wait things out before finally deciding to re-up with Nashville. The contract itself is front-loaded with an $8.5 million AV and will allow for some better flexibility in case the forward slows down once he's in his mid-30s. The $68 million price tag seems rather fair to me for a four-time 30 goal scorer, but does have a full new move clause for its first six years. Since this was probably the biggest move that GM David Poyle will be making, it's obvious that Nashville has pulled out a win here early on. I mean, we kind of have to have New Jersey in the loser category considering that, just like the Islanders and Flames, they also gave Gaudreau an offer that he reportedly turned down. According to multiple reports, including one from Pierre Lebrun, the Devils' offer to Gaudreau was a seven-year contract with an unspecified amount that was over $9 million a season. However, they did just manage to sign Andre Pallott to a reasonable five-year $30 million contract. Pallott has been a key player for Tampa for multiple seasons and will be a solid depth player for New Jersey moving forward. The contract, like Forsberg's, is also front-loaded and will help compensate for the fact that Pilat will be 36 when the deal expires. Given that this is a young team, GM Tom Fitzgerald was completely okay with slightly overpaying Pilat for his Stanley Cup pedigree. The biggest thing so far for the Islanders has been what they didn't accomplish. For months leading up to free agency, the speculation was that Gaudreau had the Islanders on his list as a potential team to sign with. However, just like several other teams, the Isles struck out regarding the Gaudreau sweepstakes. For Lou Lamorello, who was very quiet last deadline. His only real move so far has been the acquisition of defenseman Alexander Romanov, who has yet to be given a new contract. The GM will probably be hoping to land a top six forward that can play alongside Matt Barzell next season. Vladimir Tarasenko or Nazem Kadri could be the answer for Long Island. In order to compensate for the loss of Ryan Strom, GM Chris Jury decided to spring into action by signing Vincent Trocek. While proving himself in Carolina, Trocek recorded 94 points throughout the 128 games he played for the Canes. While the contract did seem a little on the pricey side, it's front-loaded and also has a full new move clause on it for the first three seasons. Knowing his previous connection with Gerard Gallant, Trocek should fit in nicely with the blue shirts. In an effort to bring Igor Shesterkin some help, Jury also recruited Yaroslav Hill Halak and signed him to a modest one-year deal that totals out to $1.5 million. Halak, who's proven time and time again to be a serviceable backup, will likely be step will likely be a step up from the struggling Alex Gorgiev, who departed for Colorado. Another team here that's been very productive so far is the Ottawa Senators. After making a huge splash that brought in Alex Dubrinkit, Pierre Dorian proved that he was just getting started. Veteran Claude Giroux decided to come home and, in turn, was granted a three-year, $19.5 million deal. Cam Talbot was a another upgrade compared to Matt Murray and will be around half of the cost. In fact, even Talbot's cap hits and Murray's dead cap are still less than it would have been to keep Murray fully on the books next season. The only real question mark was the amount of Josh Norris's extension. He's a longtime friend of Brady Kachuk and a huge part of the team, sure, but $7.95 million for eight seasons seemed kind of high for a player whose best season was 55 points in 66 games played. The issue can't be cap floor, so I'm just having a hard time understanding this one. Anyways, Dorian and his team still seem like winners as far as I'm concerned. Being a Flyers fan has to be very frustrating at the present moment. GM Chuck Fletcher voices a desire to undergo an aggressive retool, only to turn around and say this, there's a lot we need to learn about our group. Going into next offseason, we'll have more cap space than we did this offseason, Fletcher said. Anyways, aside from that confusion, the Flyers brought in Tony D'Angelo and signed him to a two-year, $10 million deal. Since Ryan Ellis has been sidelined for a while now, this was an attempt to remedy the situation. Anyway, afterwards, Fletcher failed to entice Johnny Gaudreau by not even giving him a clear offer. So far, the only other piece of news has been the signing of tough guy Nick Delorier. Other than that, there's been little effort to improve anything from Fletcher so far. For the Pittsburgh Penguins, this free agency was one of the most important to come around in a hot minutes. Due to the fact that both Chris Letang and Evgeny Malkin are simultaneously going to be UFAs, many began to question if the longtime trio of Malkin, Letang, and Crosby would indeed, for the first time, 
be split up. However, GM Ron Hextall, signed Letang to his six-year contract, valued at $36 million. Even though the term is a little much, knowing that the defenseman just had the best season of his entire career, he could still carry on the offensive magic into his late 30s. As for Evgeny Malkin, yes, he does get to stay in the Berg, but the key for Malkin will be consistency. If the forward can stay healthy and contribute at a level pace, then the four-year contract with a $24.4 million price tag may not be so bad. The Penguins also brought back Ricard Raquel and added Z-Man Jan Ruda to the mix as well from Tampa. So imagine having one of the worst tandems last season, where both of your goalies finished with a below 0.900 save percentage. And to beat it all, you decide the solution is to bring in Martin Jones from Philadelphia. Yes, I wish I was making this up. GM Ron Francis did manage to sign Andre Burakowski to a decent contract that will pay out an average of $5.5 million for five years. Even though John Klingberg and Chris Letang were at one time connected to the Kraken, the GM ended up signing Justin Schultz instead, for the time being, to a two-year, $6 million contract. Schultz, who didn't play like himself last season, seems to be slowing down. The Kraken's roster consists mostly of depth players and very little star talent. Francis could be hoping that Shane Wright and Maddie Berniers will be the top guys eventually, but it's confusing as to why Seattle continues to lowball and not try and sign some elite talents. Extensions have been the name of the game for GM Julian Breezeball. Anthony Sorelli, Mikhail Sergachev, and Eric Chernak were some of the bigger names that the Lightning kept on the books. The contracts themselves do seem reasonable except for Chernax. Known as a depth D-man, he'll be receiving a payout in the form of $5.2 million for the next five years. We can only assume that this is an overpayment for the past success that he's been a part of. The biggest loss the teams endured was watching Andre Palat walk in free agency. Ian Cole and Hayden Fleury are among some of the smaller additions that the team has made so far. I feel like Toronto is a rather tricky one to try and dissect just yet. After letting Jack Campbell walk in free agency, Kyle Dubas decided to recruit both Matt Murray and Ilya Samsonov. This could turn into a 1A, 1B type of scenario for them both. Now, obviously a big reason as to why they're still losers to me is the Murray contract, because of his injury history and inconsistency. Even though some salary was retained, it's still a head-scratcher for Dubas to take such a gamble. Even though he did sign Cali Yarncroke, who is a versatile depth forward, to a four-year, $8 million contract. The only issue here now is that the GM will be forced to make a trade down the line in order to free up some more cap space. Top that off with the questionable Victor Mete and Jordi Ben signings, and it's still an L grade this far. One of the biggest losers on this list is definitely the Vegas Golden Knights. So let's just take a step back and time for a second. In 2019, the Montreal Canadiens trade Max Pacioretty to Vegas for Nick Suzuki. Thomas Tatar, and a second round pick. Earlier this month, GM Kelly McCrimmon decided to almost repeat the flurry trade of last year by trading away his top scorer to Carolina, literally for nothing. I don't know if it's impatience to try and facilitate a better trade or what it is, but McCrimmon has proven that he sucks at free agency. But with the cap space, was able to turn around and keep Riley Smith on the books, which is something. Even though his work isn't done, the Knights are certainly in the red and have some pending RFAs and three players on the IR. So one logically has to assume that another cap dump is coming eventually this summer. Well, prior to the trade deadline even happening, GM Brian McClellan wasn't shy regarding his thoughts surrounding the cap's crease, as the GM bluntly agreed that a trade could easily facilitate an upgrade between the pipes. After striking out on Mark andre Fleury, the Caps made the choice to sign Darcy Kemper to a lengthy five-year 26 $0.5 million contract. Now, obviously, Kemper carries with him the Stanley Cup pedigree, and in order to lock him in, there had to be some compromise. Even though he was remarkable in Denver, it'll take some time to see how this will work out. Obviously, it's not an overpayment, but the term similarly to the Jack Campbell deal is the only concern. Washington also added Dylan Strom, who will be helping fill in, especially at the start of the season, up front in order to help compensate for the losses of Tom Wilson and Nicholas Backstrom. The one-year contract seems like a decent one, really, and is going to give Strom a chance to prove himself next season. Aside from the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Jets were the team with the biggest questions coming into free agency. And these questions are definitely the make-it-break-it type. As the futures of key players such as Mark Shifley, Pierre-Luc Dubois, and Captain Blake Wheeler are still unknown. The Jets ended up losing Eric Comrie and brought in a struggling David Riddick afterwards. However, this is yet another head-scratcher for an already confused fan base. 